How's it going, everybody? It is your favorite apostates. I am McKay. And I'm Jordan. And to start off today, we're just going to put out a couple reminders and things of that sort. The first housekeeping, one- Housekeeping, as usual. Yeah, housekeeping, if you will. Sorry, I know some people hate this, but uh, it's important this time, especially because you can win stuff, A. So we'll start off with that one. In our last video, we announced a giveaway for our new signature scent from Exmo Candle Co. Candles called Self Care Day. We created it in collaboration with Jen of Exmo Candle Co. She gave us all the creativity. We gave a lot of that creativity back. We just were like, hey, this is what we want the candle to smell like. She made stuff up for us and we put our stamp of approval. It's a way that you could support us. You can get a bomb smelling candle. It smells like anthropology. Yeah, and you can win one if you go to the linked video right here and I will link it for the listeners also in the, the description or I don't even know what to call that shit, but. Um, I'll link it there. You can go. All you have to do is be subscribed to our channel, our YouTube channel, and you have to leave a comment under that video. We will randomly select a single comment from that video as the winner this Saturday, April 23rd at one o'clock. So get your comments in by then and you are eligible to win. There is not any restriction of where in the world you are. We will ship to you. Doesn't matter. We want to give back to the people who made this possible. And uh, we don't want to put any limits on that. So enter for your chance to win for a candle. Second, just a quick reminder that we make exclusive content, exclusive videos, long videos, the same length of our typical videos on here. We make them exclusively for our patrons over on Patreon. And we do fun content that sometimes would not be YouTube approved <laughs> yeah. over there. And so if you'd like to see those things, our lowest tier is $3 a month and you can access all of those things. So consider it, consider supporting us. We are thankful and grateful immensely to all of you who support us in that way. Our patrons are amazing. Everybody's so awesome. And we are forever grateful for every single one of them. That's why we wanna put them in every single one of our videos. So. Subscribe to our Patreon and you can get exclusive content. And you get exclusive, uh, some exclusive tiers in our Discord if that's something that you would like to do. That's true. So. And you get your name at the end of the video. That's yeah. super cool. That is cool. Finally, as promised, we I said last week that we were going to get the stickers up as soon as we got them in. I was unaware that there was a strike going on among Etsy sellers because this isn't like our main thing. So in solidarity with those who a primary source of their income is Etsy, we decided to hold off on restocking our Twitter or our Twitter, <laughs> our Etsy and bringing out these new options or these new stickers. So we have a couple of them. I wanted to share one that is very special and exclusive. We already showed off the designs, but this cool holographic sticker, I'm gonna put it right here in the middle, could be yours. They are a limited quantity. We will put the link in the description for, of this video if that's something that you would like. If you wanna see people getting their Garmies in a bunch, then that one's for you. So we have that one. We just have the standard like black and white version of the same one. The Yellowstone Wolves, I'm trying to show it on camera. Um, Yellowstone Wolves, the Yellowstone Wolves sticker as well. Um, I've had these ones for a while, but we just haven't put them up. The metal version of the Satan's Ponzi scheme logo. Um, you can get all of these in t-shirt and sweatshirt form on our Teespring as well. So if that's some of the ways that you would like to support us, then, uh, yeah, check out the links in the description and you can get your hands on some of these cool ass stickers. Okay, thank you for bearing with us. I know that it gets to be a lot sometimes, but it's all kind of fallen on the same days. On to our topic for the day. Um, this one kind of was spurred by doing some of the other influencer series. I don't know if we're gonna put this in the influencer category, I but would. okay, yeah, it's They're not like a uh, influencer like you would. Like a lot of times, we tend to think of influencers as people who are on Instagram and YouTube and things like that. But yeah. um, this is kind of a different style of influencer. While we were doing some 
some research for this video, I came across an interesting fact and I want you to go with me on a journey. Let's say you're getting in your car. It's seven in the morning, you're on your way to work and you look down and you glance at your odometer and it reads 42069. Now, the first thing you would think of is not William Clayton, former Mormon apostle, when you look at your odometer, but William Clayton was the inventor of a very rudimentary early odometer called the Rodometer that later became what we use on our vehicles to uh, count how far they have been. I was like, what the shit? So, a lot, I mean, Mormons are everywhere is what we're trying to say with this. And you just, a lot of times you don't even realize that. So anyway, this time around, we wanted to talk about kind of the influencers of music and uh, Mormons in music media and things like that. Uh, because it's a lot more people than you realize a lot of times. Anyway, let's get on with it. Okay, so this was McKay's kind of brainchild. Sometimes <laughs> it is hard to put all of the influencers together in a cohesive manner. Because if you watched our last video, the McKnight video, then you probably listened to us talk about the fact that this is like a, what do you call it? I never remember. A multiverse. A, a Mormon multiverse. multiverse. I want to say metaverse. That's metaverse. what comes to mind. So that's what it is with Mormons in media, music, Instagram, you know, the blogging, vlogging, YouTube, the works, right? There's just this like really weird infinite connections happening and they're all together and some of them are related and it it's just this bizarre conundrum, right? Yeah. So we're kind of navigating through that web and taking you with us on that journey of how all of these two are, like how all of these people are connected and why. It is very bizarre. The deeper you dive, the more you realize the weirdness. It's so interconnected in such an odd way. And there's, man, it's just weird to think about. It is. It is. So we do these videos, and again, this one is a little different, but I still would classify these people as influencers because they they hold influence over people. Um, so this one is a little bit different in that sense, but the main reason that we do these videos, if you followed us for a while, you know, but why do we do these videos? So you know where your money is going if you choose to support people. Um, this one is a little special because um, there's a lot of talk around separating the artist from the art and things of that nature. I think there can be some nuance applied to the music industry and things like that because when we're talking about influencers, we're talking usually about a singular person or a family where all the money that's being made is going to them or corporations that sponsor them or whatever. So it's a little easier to just be like kind of just, okay, I don't want to like watch them. I don't want to follow them or anything like that. Whereas music, a lot of times there's a lot of people involved and one person out of the bunch could be Mormon and you know, a single play on Spotify is not going to <laughs> contribute a large amount of money to the Mormon church's coffers by way of that person's tithing. So a little more nuance can be applied to it. In some cases, I mean, you might want to be, be like, I don't really support these people and I don't support what they believe in. So I don't know if I want to continue supporting them, uh, but also just be aware that other people are kind of thrown into the mix in a lot of cases. So, so there's some nuance to this. There, there's, uh, I will allow for a, a great deal of nuance. But we, on this one. we volley the ball back in your court to decide. It's important do with that this people information know what you will, yeah. right? And it, as is our whole channel, it's just interesting because for a lot of, and it's the same thing with a lot of musicians, and maybe it's not intentional, but I would still argue that there is a brand. And a lot of musicians maintain their reputation and brand in a certain way. And Mormonism typically isn't at the forefront um, of that. It's usually not for the majority of like top 100, 
you know, Grammy winning musicians, Mormonism isn't like at the forefront yeah. <laughs> of their music. Um, there are obviously some very niche like Mormon musicians, um, but they're not like played on the radio on the regular. Yeah. So do with this information what you will. More so than anything, it's just interesting to share these things with you, and hopefully we give you some that you were not anticipating. So, to kick it off, we have the Queen of Soul herself, Gladys Knight. Ooh. Gladys Knight. This one, I feel like, surprises a lot of people when we talk about her. Um, and she is not just sidelined, quiet Mormon. Um, she is very active and upfront, um, and puts Mormonism in, you know, at the forefront of a lot of things, not necessarily her music, but in interviews, um, she participates in church activities, like church wide activities. Um, so she's a little unique in that sense. If you're not as familiar with Gladys Knight, she is a seven time Grammy award winner. Um, she has her own star on the Hollywood Whole walk, walk of, of fame. fame. And she was also inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, Damn. Yeah, she's kick ass. That's killing it. And so she she did perform in a band called The Pips, and then she went on to have a solo career um, as well. But I think the interesting thing about her is she has a really interesting life story. If you've never read anything about Gladys Knight, she's got quite the twists and turns um, in her journey. But she was not born and raised Mormon. Um, she was actually converted to Mormonism by her kids. Um, and yeah. her kids were actually converted by a friend, family member. I think it was a coworker or something. I think it was mm -hmm. a coworker um, who converted her son to Mormonism and then her daughter. Um, and then it just kind of as one does when you get converted or a family member gets converted, it turns into, hey, you should come with me to this activity. Come, yeah. <laughs> come to church with me on Sunday. Yeah. Which, yeah. Which, I mean, she was a Baptist before and a, a Catholic at one point mm -hmm. on, on both of those. So it probably wasn't that odd of a, a thing to her. But, I mean, now it's the Mormon church and... I'm sure Baptists and Catholics alike have really strong opinions on on Mormonism. So <laughs> kind true. of interesting how she ended up there. It but. is. And she, it was later in life, she was baptized eventually by her son in 1997. Um, and so that is, I mean, the best way I think I could put it is she is very much a golden convert. <laughs> yeah. Um, Grammy winner. <laughs> Roll like, of, rock and roll hall and fame inductee like wow whichever missionaries participated in her conversion are gonna tell that story for the rest of their lives the whether that lives. whether they remain mormon <laughs> or not that is that is a scenario you don't encounter very often if you are the missionary or you know the missionaries who baptize gladys knight please please email us <laughs> it is <laughs> love to hear it I cannot even imagine. So she was baptized in 1997. Her husband later joined her in 2001. Um, and so we've talked about this before, and it's not really, for the most part, especially now, a mystery to anyone that racism, institutional racism, bigotry, all of those things are kind of very much embedded within the Mormon church. Racism, very prevalent even up to today. Um, but, and that's becoming even more, like, widely known due to the work of the Black Menaces, if you don't follow them on TikTok, Yeah, follow people them. were asking all last video, they were like, talk about the Black Menaces. We love like, them. We love them. They can talk about themselves, so head over to TikTok. I, if you haven't heard of them and you're on TikTok, I don't know how, I feel like... They have picked up so much steam. It's amazing. They Seriously. deserve every single last bit of it. Um, but they're doing the same thing. It's a group of black students at BYU who are just bringing attention to these issues. And it's fascinating because they're asking questions of students on BYU's campus. And so the answer is really kind of... <laughs> some of the answers may surprise you. Some of them may make you cry. Some of them may make you punch things. Um, <laughs> but that's... It's still an issue. Um, I think a common misconception around Mormonism is that those things have kind of been weeded out and it's not so much of an issue anymore. 
Especially since leadership isn't, like, actively saying, yeah. like, obviously, like, covertly, you know. Maybe, I mean, the church does more covertly, but. Yeah. Ever since they desegregated the blood donations at LDS Hospital in Salt Lake City, it's less of an overt thing. That was this today I learned. I swear to God. <laughs> Every, like every day that we continue, even on days where I don't think about Mormonism, when we're not making content or doing anything, even on those days, something like this comes up and I am like, you have got to be effing kidding me. <sighs> Anywho. God's church, right? God's church. So this was, especially at the time, 1997, this was kind of momentous in the church because the church was trying to undo a lot of kind of racist perceptions that people had about the church in, you know, the years leading up to that. And <laughs> rightfully so. <laughs> um, if you watched our last video, you know that there was a previous prophet in the church who thought the civil rights movement was a communist ploy. Um, and so <laughs> as far as public relations goes, there was a lot of work <laughs> that yeah. needed to be done to fix these things. Um, and so Gladys Knight coming and joining the church, I imagine was a very public spectacle. For real. Um, and that was only like 20 years after they lifted the priesthood ban. Yeah. So what is the priesthood ban? Because we need to cover okay. that. Yeah. Uh, I have mentioned this in a couple comments before, um, but after the death of Joseph Smith and prior to 1979, black men were not allowed to hold the priesthood. And by extension, black men and women, people, a lot of people don't talk about this, but black women were also a huge target of this. They weren't allowed we're not to allowed to the enter temple. the temple. So white people were going and they were being sealed to their families for time and all eternity. And black people were not afforded that same thing until a hundred years almost 125 years after the death of Joseph Smith. So so it was a big deal when that was repealed and they got love and adoration and inspiration and revelation yeah, from... Yeah, and God finally allowed them. God finally allowed the black people to have the fake men penis power. And so once that happened, I think the church kind of was under this impression that that would rectify things. Um and it would be perceived as like a gift. Like, here you are. We're giving you this lovely thing that everyone else has had, um, but you don't. So this was a big deal when Gladys and I got baptized. And probably knowing the weight that she would have in this space, knowing that she was, you know, in the public eye constantly. She's extremely talented. Um, she could pull a little bit of way with leaders in yeah. the church and she did which i am grateful for in that sense because she pushed some things along that i don't think would have happened um if she did not and so there is something called the mormon tabernacle choir that we'll talk about in a minute um which as far as diversity goes even today is lacking is pretty minimal um but knowing that and recognizing that and seeing that there was a huge lack of diversity and representation within the church, especially within music, um, Gladys Knight took it upon herself to create essentially a multicultural choir. Um, and this was after she had kind of poked fun a little bit at the prophet for, you know, not having a lot of soul and pep <laughs> in the music, which obviously it's lacking. Um, and so... She had a connection with the prophet of the church, which was no small thing, even to this day. No small thing. Um, and then most recently, what did I say? It was 2018? Yes, was 2018? 2018, you said. So 2018, they had a 40th anniversary celebration of black people being able to hold the priesthood, hold the priesthood. into the temple. Yeah. So, which I have my own thoughts on. But they had this whole celebration in honor of this and, you know, we've come so far and it was such a magnificent experience that God finally allowed black people to have it. And here we are, we're going to celebrate that 40 years later. Um, and so they made it a whole big thing. This was a big event. It was televised. They had a bunch of like one of the apostles, at least the prophet and one of the apostles spoke. Um, there was music, performances. And so it was a big deal. Um, and it was broadcast and all members across the globe could watch it. And so it was 
I don't feel like there's really anything like that focusing like <laughs> primarily on diversity and representation within the church no. that actively happens. Um, and so that was like a... At least not through a like colonizer lens. No, no. Like, like they have the Polynesian Cultural Center in Hawaii, but... Uh, it's, that's another topic for another day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not a fan of that. <laughs> so <clears throat> in essence, that's Gladys Knight. Uh, she was not born and raised Mormon, but she is a phenomenal person, a very talented person. The church is very privileged to be able to have her in their ranks. Seriously. So. Yeah. But I mean, it was like a, here's a spectacle and we're going to be inclusive, have all kinds of black talent uh, participate in this thing. And then since then, like radio silence, it's like, here's our exhibition and yeah. You guys can go back to sitting in the pews and surrounded by the racist ideology that made it all happen by yeah. the racist God that implemented. Yeah. Finally, our God decided that he was done being an absolute dick. <laughs> and uh, like, what is better? Like your leadership is absolute shit and racist or your God was racist up until 1979. Like. What's the what's the worst of the two things there? If there are Mormons that come in this comment section and argue this, please Do stop. Not. Please stop. I don't want to hear it. There is no arguing this. None. Please stop. Sit down. Shut up. Nobody wants to hear it. Anyway, let's move on to our next big name in music Mormon dumb. <laughs> Mormon music dumb. <laughs> Next, we have talked about them before, and we are more likely than not going to do a deep dive on them altogether. But Donnie and Marie, probably, you know, the most significant of the two, but the Osmonds on the whole are all Mormon. And they were not converts. They are born and raised in the church here in Utah. <laughs> So they are Utah Mormons, even better. Even better. Even better. Um, I'm not going to go into who the Osmonds are because the majority of you hopefully probably know who they are, but they are extremely talented. They've sold 77 million records worldwide. Donnie and Marie have gone on to do their own things that have been super successful. Yeah. I think uh, among them being a variety show in mm -hmm. the 70s or 80s or something yep. like that. I have never seen it, but... Yep. It was extremely popular. So in short summary, just to kind of give you an idea, um, the makeup of the Osmond family, the parents of Donnie and the rest of his siblings, um, George and Olive are their names. George actually <laughs> served two missions, which was much more common, like way back when. That was often a thing where they would send missionaries out to one mission. They still weren't married. And so they'd be like, hey, we need other people in this area. So we'll send really? you here. Yeah, it was really common. I've never known of anybody who's ever done that. I had so many members of my family who went on like double missions. Oh, oh, we're talking about like old. Never mind. I'm dumb. Don't listen it's, to me. I mean, it's Donnie's dad. Yeah, okay. But so I mean, Donnie's. Really He's oldish. You're an insult. Sorry, people. sorry. If Donnie is your age, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's gonna be some offended people in the comments right now. Um. <laughs> sorry, I I know we have some some older viewers and they usually identify themselves. We as love such, you. But sorry. <laughs> so he went on two missions, dedicated AF. Um, they come, the Osmonds on both sides come from a family of pioneer ancestry. So they are Mormon through and through the majority. There's nine of them total, uh, which tracks <laughs> as far nice. as Mormonism goes. They were also kind of trendsetters in another way. The first two children of the Osmonds were actually born with significant hearing loss and so at the time, within Mormondom, within the Mormon church, there had not been any deaf missionaries. And so these two, uh, their names are Tom and Verl, these two were the first deaf missionaries for the church. And that is less of a thing, I feel like now it's more... Yeah. There's a lot more accessibilities to serving the Mormon mission nowadays than there ever have been. So there are a uh, lot that's of, good on them. Obviously, yeah. I, I have strong feelings about the missionary program, but 
for as much as they build up the missionary program in the minds of literally every single fucking member, it's good that they offer options to people with disabilities and things like that. Yeah. And it, like, I know, I think they still do. They'll call people to missions where the language that they learn is ASL. Yep. So that's happening simultaneously. I don't, I mean, as far, we've talked about this before, as far as ableism within Mormonism, it's prevalent as it is in other things. come a long way (laughs) in a short time. With a long way to go. And so it could be much more inclusive in that sense. But at least we have that going. Yeah. Right. Donnie particularly is like deep in. (laughs) (laughs) This guy bleeds Book of Mormon blue, man. He does. He does. I remember that um, just a couple weeks ago, there was that picture of him. Apparently, he teaches his local Sunday school class. Mm -hmm. For the youth. For the, yes, for the youth. And he dressed up in his coat of many colors. Did he play Joseph in that musical? I'm pretty sure. And they had a Bible lesson about Joseph. And it's kind of weird. It's kind of cringe, honestly. (laughs) It's very cringe, and it gives yeah. this, like, elitist, like, I'm being taught by Donny Osmond, Osmond, or Donny Osmond's like, look at me gracing these kids with the knowledge of God in the Bible. And here's why we need to do a video on the Osmonds in particular, because when it came out, when the Osmonds gained popularity, and it began to come out that they were Mormon, there was a basically Mormon epidemic <laughs> at that time. <laughs> There was mass amounts of people who were converted to Mormonism because of Donnie and the Osmonds in general. Like, it it was absolutely crazy. I know someone personally who had missionary discussions in, like, groups of teenage girls because they were converting because the Osmonds were Mormon. And I'm not even joking. They would meet with missionaries and there would be, like, 15 girls in a group who were all considering being baptized I'm not joking when I said this made waves in the Mormon church. And there are a lot of people who, you know, ended up being baptized by Donnie himself. And it is a hallmark of many Mormon stories where they're like, oh, my dad was baptized by Donnie. And it was like the greatest experience of his life. Like, why wouldn't it be? So it was a very, very big tool for the church at the time. And so we might do a video on them kind of more in depth. But as of, I can't remember what article that I read, but as of recent, um, 58 grandkids, 48 great grandkids. Sheesh. Just very representative of Mormonism, to say the least. Seriously, that's almost an, as many uh, grandkids if each grandkid represented 1 million albums sold. <laughs> These people Look sold 77 million s- albums <laughs> worldwide. That's insane. It is insane. So the majority of them, as far as all the siblings go, the majority of them were married in temples. Um, like Donnie was married in the Salt Lake Temple, same one that we were married in. What? What? Um, Marie has been married multiple times, but she was at one point married to a BYU basketball player. And she was married at least at one point in the Jordan River Temple, which is also here in Utah. And so these people bleed Mormonism through and through, right? Donnie was also really vocal about Prop 8. He was very, there was a... In support of? There was a very, yes. Okay. There was a very, like, not well-worded quote that he was like, I have homosexual friends, but that I love them, but they can't be homosexual. Did he pull a Nate? Basically. (laughs) Basically, that's what it that's what it makes me think like, of. Oh, the I I love the homosexuals, but if you didn't watch that video, it's yeah. really old. Yeah. Um, Sorry if you don't get the reference. <laughs> <laughs> but that's essentially what they said. So not just socially. Right. It's I mean, when you represent the brand, I, I imagine that there were conversations at least at some point between church PR and the Osmonds, at least yeah. at some point, right? Well, I've, I've definitely seen clips of them being interviewed and people ta- or asking them about Mormonism. I remember a clip specifically of um, somebody asking Donnie about the priesthood ban and he... Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'll be able to show it. I think it's on a pretty major news network, but yeah. 
it, it was not a cute look oh, by man, any means. Oh man, I told yeah, he like he, he got really real mad about it. that. <laughs> if we can't throw it in here, we'll put a link in the description yeah, so I'll you put can a watch link it. In there if, if we can't put it in. Bizarre. So that's the Osmonds in like very very short summary. The majority of them are still Mormon, like down to their kids. The majority in the research that I did, like pretty much all of their kids have gone on missions. And that's a lot. That's a lot of kids. So Mormon through and through. Next. These next two ones, we are going to offer a a lot more slack due to recent events and uh, things that they do uh, because... I don't want to speak for them, obviously, but um, in some cases, they do seem like they're on the outs, and they are at least uh, showing that they're better people than the rhetoric of the Mormon church. One of those people is David Archuleta, one of the runner-ups to, uh, I don't know what season of American Idol it was, but it was in 2010, so you probably heard about him. David was essentially the face of Mormonism for like the 10 years (laughs) following that. Um, He, I mean, he had a a lot of following because of that American Idol. He is a fantastic singer. Mm -hmm. I remember when he went on his mission, it was just like this big thing. And everybody was like, oh my God, David's on a mission. He He went to Chile. The, I think the biggest thing about that, though, it was because he was at a really high point in his Seriously. career at that time. And he was being, I mean, he was extremely successful at that point and had a lot like going for him. And so the fact that, and it was very much a, yeah. a hard on for Mormons because they were like, he is making so much money and he's so talented and he has the ability to go so far, but he's going to put that all aside to serve the Lord. Yeah. That's like a huge thing in, in sports. Like you see a lot of these BYU sports stars, mm-hmm. they go on their mission and people are like, oh my God, it's so admirable. They're going to serve the Lord. And they do this with the idea that they're going to be blessed. And then they come back from their mission and it's been two years where they haven't trained and it's they've fallen off. Things are different, yeah. especially in the music industry. There's no guarantee that you're going to yeah. still be there when you get back. Yeah. Well, at least in the music, uh, in David's case, I mean, he could always sing. True. So that's good. But I mean, I think of Mark. I always go back to Mark Oslin's Mormon story. If you haven't heard it, check it out. It's awesome. But he was this star baseball player, left on a mission, had the absolute worst time on his mission, came back, had one injury and was done with baseball for the rest of his life. <laughs> He was planning on going pro, and there were people who were watching him. He was going to go pro. Yeah, and uh, one injury, and he was done. And ended up being swept into the school church education system, and and that was a whole thing. But Mark is a really admirable person. But yeah, it's kind of like leaving on a mission is this big thing because you're taking a step, and you are believing that God is going to bless you for going out as a missionary, and then you come back. And in a lot of same. yeah, a lot of cases, things aren't the same. I. Maybe it's just because we were Mormon, we heard about David Archuleta after he came from They latch on to their celebrities. (laughs) Oh, seriously. (laughs) Like we just talked about the previous two. They latch on to them like nobody's business. But David Archuleta was very much the poster boy for Mormonism for a long time. And he was adorable. Like he's the cutest guy. Like he has, I had his, um, I had a poster poster of him up on my wall. Nice. Like the ones that I would buy those like stupid teen magazines at like Walgreens that when you opened them up they had the the posters that you would rip out oh my god (laughs) oh god I'm embarrassed but I had a poster of him on my wall and when Crush came out I listened to that shit on repeat for like a decade like that song still gets me one of my siblings is really big into him um but yeah recently um it's just kind of been oh, David Archuleta is kind of getting swept under the rug, especially when he came out as a member of the LGBTQIA plus community. I think it probably, it was a big deal for a lot of people, especially ex-Mormons, because we're like, this could be a really bad thing in his life where he's realizing that he doesn't feel welcome in the church. And I hope if he is choosing to deconstruct and things like that, which kind of seems like he is, that he's able to come out of it um, with a lot better mental health and things like that. Because he he came out 
to his family in 2014 um, and did not say anything publicly about anything like that until mm-hmm. 2021. So this was extremely recent uh, when he went public with it and it took especially Mormonism by storm. So that is, I feel like it's a really good needed thing in Mormonism because a lot of people look up to him and it's as much as he's navigating this as many of the others have who are in the public light and are, you know, well known trying to navigate I'm gay, I'm part of the LGBTQ plus community, but I'm also trying to be within Mormonism or try to, you know, align myself as much with Mormonism as I can. And for many, it's just, it just doesn't work. It's just disheartening because I think a lot of people end up seeing the truth that like the church talks out of both sides of its mouth where it's saying that people are welcome, they can exist. But then they see the awful truth of, yeah, I can exist, but I don't get to do A, B, C, or D. I have to basically just confine myself within the commandments and forsake who I am. I'm not allowed to love who I want to love or anything of that nature, which I think he had an Instagram live recently where that was really kind of he, the focal point about of, that in depth. yeah, and that leading to severe troubles with his mental health, so... And it's, yeah, it's been interesting to see from like a Mormon perspective, having Mormon family and friends who are seeing this now and seeing that he's come out and it's not, it's not so black and white. Like he's very nuanced kind of about where he is right now. Like he, some people have tried to put some labels on him and been like, oh, okay, so are you bisexual? And he's like, kind of, I feel like I fall under, like, I feel the same about both genders. So I feel like I fall under the umbrella of bisexuality, but I'm not really sure. And then he's also talked about being asexual. And so these are all kind of non-binary things and ace things are not (laughs) within mainstream Mormon vocabulary. So I feel like it's kind of pushed Mormons a little bit because they, you know, they read, they're reading the articles. They're like, this is David Archuleta. He's this huge Mormon guy. And now I'm like, what is happening? I've heard that he's come out. What is like, what does that entail? What does that mean? Yeah. Which is, is disappointing that that's the way that people have to kind of be educated, (laughs) but that's Mormonism. I mean, learning and progressing is, is very slow within the, the Mormon population. Obviously the church, I, and staunchly, they're not progressing at all. But if at least the Mormon general public can, you know, I'll take that. Yeah. So that's David. I I hope to see more great things from him in the future. I think what he's doing, being public about these things and sharing his story, there's so many young people, especially yeah. that are going, that are looking at what he's doing and it's making a difference. I mean, he could have, I mean, he might have saved lives at this point Yeah, with how public and open and vulnerable he's been with his journey and trying to navigate his own identity and Mormonism at the same time and can they coexist. And so his vulnerability in this whole process is just kind of, it's been really stunning to watch and it's very admirable that he's been willing to share that publicly because it's hard to navigate things like that behind closed doors but he's a celebrity like that yeah that makes it like 15 times worse so hats off to david archuleta love him my teen girl heart will beat for him forever <clears throat> next up next this one is part of a band <gasps> you may love them i don't but i'm not gonna <laughs> yuck your n- yum the lead singer of imagine dragons dan reynolds is a mormon or at least slash Maybe was. Maybe was a Mormon. <laughs> um, he has not really made things public about if he has split from the church or not. However, notably, he did say this year that he was more sp- spiritual and didn't really get much from religion. He also noted that he is not really like raising his kids in any type of religious thing, which makes us think that he's more than likely on the outs. But he is an interesting case because he was raised Mormon. Yeah. Uh, in Nevada, there is, I don't think we've talked about this before, but there is a significant population of Mormons in Nevada. 
Sin City was founded by the Mormons. Las Vegas in particular, which sounds probably absolutely crazy if you're not familiar with Mormonism, but there is quite a bit of them out there. Like sister wives, yeah. they lived out there for a time. There is quite a big Mormon population out there. Oh, yeah, for sure. He also went to BYU. BYU alumnus. I can't remember if he graduated or not, but he did. I think there was some murmurings about him like losing his ecclesiastical endorsement and then going back or something. So he might not have been your like black and white, true blue Mormon. Yeah. Which is kind of nice to see. Yeah. I remember like earlier, probably in the in the 2010s where we'd be like, oh my God, Dan Reynolds, he was on stage and jumped and you could see his garments. Oh my God. <laughs> It was the dumbest thing to fixate over. Um, when yeah. you're Mormon, you have to hold on to those things, though, because it it demonstrates a sense of normalcy. Because people are like, Mormons are weird. Mormons are freaks. Mormons have horns, like all this stuff, right? But then, especially as kids and teenagers, you can be like, well, guess what? Dan Reynolds is Mormon. He's and a rock star. Like, oh, wait yeah. a minute, what? So it yeah. absolutely is... It's a tactic I used quite frequently if people brought up like the weirdness. Oh, of Mormonism. for sure. Yeah. It's an easy, super easy talking point to just normalize it like that. And you're like, yep. oh, I didn't know that. And that's kind of like the genius of that tactic. Yep. Uh, another, uh, another, I think he's from Vegas, but I know he lives in Vegas because I was in the MTC with a, uh, the missionary training center with another missionary. And he was like, I think he's from Henderson. And he was like, oh, yeah, I'd see Brandon Flowers all the time. So Brandon Flowers, the lead singer of The Killers, is also, he is a current Mormon as far as I know. Yep. Um, anytime I think of Brandon Flowers now, I think of this old right here was a simp for Joseph Smith. Oh, my God. It was the That's fact that he was like getting angry about. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but about basically the attack on the Book of Mormon. And he's like, oh, uh, <laughs> watch the whole clip. It's it gets even better. But um, that that part in particular, I was like, dude, come on this. You don't even really know about Joseph Smith. And you're like, go in to defend him. We can link that in the description, too. So yeah. you can watch the whole thing. It is very much. A, and you'll notice this with Mormons, too, is when they get confronted about things like historically uh, about the Book of Mormon, a lot of it will be like, well, we have professors and historians yeah. within the church who have researched this night Why and don't day for you decades. do your research? Yeah. Like, okay, nice rebuttal there. So he was raised in Vegas, at least for a bit, or in Nevada somewhere. And then they moved to a city called Nephi in Utah. <laughs> Nephi, like at the Book of Mormon, you know. Yeah. There is a lot of, if you haven't figured it out yet, there's a lot of Mormon cities named after characters. Because that's what and they are. And places. Characters and places in the Book of Mormon. So Nephi is one of them. Like I said, he was raised Mormon. He also participated in the huge I'm a Mormon campaigns that happened. When was that? Uh, like it was early 2010s. 2010s. Yeah. So, and we've talked, we've touched on that like briefly before, but the church did like a giant PR campaign where they like just, they pulled every slightly famous Mormon yeah. that they could and basically made them do an ad where they were like, here's me, I'm a rock star, I'm a dad, I'm a cool person, and I'm a Mormon. Just like as a little like, like hey, everybody, these things can coexist all yeah. together. Yeah. So he had one of those that was really popular. As did a lot of the other ones. I'm pretty yeah. sure the Osmonds did one. I uh, always talk to people about the the drummer from Neon Trees. Yeah. I can't think of her name off the top of my head. Like Elise or something. Something like that. Yeah, drummer from Neon Trees is Mormon too. Yeah. They're a primarily Mormon band prior to Tyler Glenn leaving. Yeah, Tyler Glenn was Mormon. Now is not. Uh, lead singer of Neon Trees. Lead singer of Neon Trees. Notably released a solo album called Excommunicated. Uh, we talked about one of his music videos as one of the Patreon exclusive videos. So if you would like to check that out, remember, patreon.com slash Jordan McKay, and you can uh, see us talking about that It music is a video. phenomenal music video. It's awesome. Like it, the theatrics, the symbolism, it is truly amazing. We break it down for you like yeah. in depth. You get to watch him spit on Joseph Smith. It's really great. It's pretty cool. Anyway, Brandon Flowers, <laughs> The Killers. I listened to The Killers a bunch. We had Hot Fuss burned on a CD mm -hmm. in our family car that we listened to all the time. All the time. All these things that so. I've done was actually written about the fact that he didn't serve a mission. Yep. 
I think that one was on that album, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. It, I mean, they played it on the radio. It was a pretty popular song. Yeah. They had a, a song in Guitar Hero 3. When You Were Young, Mr. Brightside. I remember playing When You Were Young on Guitar Hero 3, and I was like, this guy's a Mormon. That's crazy. He's on Guitar Hero. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, there's Brendan Flowers. So there is like some of the really more popular ones. Um, the next few are less popular. The The next few that we're going to talk about all like really have huge followings on YouTube. Uh, we're going to start with The Piano Guys. The Piano Guys. Oh, they were so big for me on my mission because they they were Mormon, so it was easy to kind of like rip their songs off of YouTube and listen to them because it you would be listen to anything else. uplifting. Yeah. There is four of them, and they are all devout Mormons currently. So there's two really popular ones that people are familiar with, but there's actually four of them total. They are all devout Mormons currently. So they all served missions. They Mormonism is very much part of their brand, which is a lot different than the other musicians that we've discussed. Like they've done interviews where they talk about, you know, praying before every taping or recording or practice mm -hmm. or rehearsal, whatever. Um, just kind of incorporating lots of simple Mormon things into their like into their practices, what they do. Same thing with not like recording or playing or doing things like that on Sundays. So it's very much at the forefront of their brand. It is wholesome, no swearing, nothing inappropriate. Yeah. Very and that's why it was really easy to be able to just listen to that stuff. on my. I remember I um, particularly they did a, a cover of uh, More Than Words by Extreme, which Extreme is a a hair metal i don't know if they're hair metal or whatever but classic song or whatever wouldn't exactly be what i would classify as uplifting spiritual music but i mean it was by mormon guys how could it not be bad i i would listen to that one all the time when i was a missionary yeah yeah so one of the main reasons that i wanted to include the piano guys is there's this weird connection so in 2015 they broke a record like a legit record where they had a Christmas nativity and they went about it with like an inordinate amount of people. So they had a thousand people participate in this nativity, which was record breaking. It's the most people that's ever participated in like a live action nativity apparently. But was it a Guinness certified world record? I think record? it was. Really? I'm not for sure. I'm not for sure. Maybe I'll throw it up there if, if that is If correct. it is. It was very elaborate. They had the costumes, you know, all the things. It was very much like true to life right <laughs> <laughs> as as true to life as mythology could be right <laughs> so i'm going to have i took a screenshot of it but i'm going to have mckay throw up the screenshot right now there's two in particular that i want you to look at and i want you to ponder them for a moment and think where, where maybe have i seen this before if this looks familiar to you, it's because the first one is Mindy McKnight from Cute Girls Hairstyles. And the second, the two youngins there are Brooklyn and Bailey <laughs> from their YouTube channel. The Mormon multiverse. Literally. <laughs> you probably couldn't, you would know every single celebrity on the planet just through Mormon connections. Probably. Seriously. You probably could. It's like. Especially in the music world. Like just through at least the piano guys, you could probably. I'm. I've been. It wasn't Lindy? Ugh, wasn't Lindsay Sterling? We're gonna talk about her in just a second. Lindsay Sterling also in that video. I think so. Lindsay Sterling. Lindsay Sterling has done shit with, um, a whole bunch of like electronic music people. Mm -hmm. I remember watching a video that Freddie Wong on YouTube did with Lindsay Sterling. <laughs> um, she did a thing with uh, a song with. Oh, what is her name? Lucy Hale from Hailstorm. So, I mean, there's your your connection to rock music. It's insane, the amount of connections it's that you can It's crazy. Find. Like, we have Mormon musicians, and then we throw in probably one of the most prominent Mormon influencers out there as far as Instagram, social media, YouTube goes. So, weird. Super weird, weird connection. So Super weird. the three of them, the McKnights participated in this nativity and they are, as you can see in this video. So very, very bizarre. 
So as McKay just mentioned, the next one that we wanted to talk about was Lindsay Sterling. She's a violinist, a songwriter, and a dancer. She has a YouTube channel that has, I think last I looked, had like millions of subs. So she is very popular. I feel like very well known, at least amongst the like YouTube musician community. Yeah. Uh, she is, I think I read in her bio that she was born and raised Mormon. She did attend BYU. She went to BYU and she did serve a mission in New York. So she is pretty Mormon through and through as far as like considering modesty and style and performances and things. I don't think I've ever seen her wear anything that would be inappropriate. Except for on Dancing in the Star or Dancing with the Stars. She was on... I remember seeing her on there. I was like, that doesn't look very garment friendly. Obviously, I don't give a shit if she Lindsay actually, Sterling is dressing garment friendly. But I don't even know if she's gone through the temple because she's not married. So there's your, Maybe, I thought she was. There you go. She's dated a few people, but unless the Wikipedia article was wrong. <laughs> there you <laughs> as go. As far as I know, she's not married. There you go. We need to pour over some gossip forums and see. For real. Maybe. No, I'm she, kidding. She also, like we talked about a few minutes ago, also had an I'm a Mormon campaign where she talked about, I'm a violinist, and I'm talented, and I have a YouTube channel, and I'm a Mormon. So she had one of those two. YouTuber, violinist, Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> That's very much how it was. So she had one of those as well. She also, they did like a kind of a, not like a devotional, but kind of a, the church sometimes does like youth Q&A type scenarios, like events that are broadcast across the world where the apostles will come and the teenagers will ask questions and then the apostles will will answer them. They did like a youth broadcast where she participated and they asked her questions about things, which I thought was interesting. I don't remember how long ago that was, but that was That's weird. That's an interesting move. As far as Mormon standards go. Yeah, that's odd. Good for St- Lindsay then, honestly. I want to say Sterling. <laughs> Good for S- S- Lindsay. <laughs> Jesus. Some other interesting ones that I like to throw in here um, because we have connections there. But these two, well, one of them for sure isn't Mormon. If you're familiar with Panic at the Disco, lead singer Brendan Erie was raised Mormon as well. He was also raised in Vegas. And he actually left the church at 17, um, essentially citing some differences and not feeling comfortable with the doctrine and not feeling like it it was for him. Rightfully so. <laughs> Rightfully so. So he left the church at 17 and actually was essentially kicked out by his parents. Uh, things were eventually rectified uh, based on what I read. But that initial I'm leaving the church and getting kicked out is... Not completely uncommon within Mormonism, which is unfortunate. So he is not Mormon anymore. He has written a few songs, um, kind of hints here and there about his experiences. Yeah. So if you've listened to some of his stuff and you're like, now you'll, if you listen to his stuff, now you'll be like, oh, that's interesting. Interesting. Uh, Same thing with Dallin Weeks, who actually used to be a part of Panic! at the Disco before all of them went separate ways and Brendan Urie did his solo stuff um he is currently in a band where they what is it i don't know how but they found me it's kind of funny too because uh a person that i grew up around and probably did a little dirty on one occasion um is really close with dallin and breezy his wife which is kind of like the weirdest connection of all time it's weird like very connected like knows them personally and spends time with him yeah it's weird other ones in the alt scene uh, that we'll, I'll just mention by name really quick. Um, the Aquabats. I don't know about anybody who's watching this. I'm probably the only one who ever listened to the Aquabats out of anybody who watches this video. But the Bat Commander particularly, he grew up in goddamn Rexburg, Idaho. <laughs> like this guy is as Mormon as they come. The Bat Commander Christian Jacobs. Um, him and Ian Fowles, I believe is his name, were band members of the Aquabats. They're also co-creators of the TV show Yo Gabba Gabba. So Say what now? if that if that gives you any if you've never heard of the Aquabats but you know of uh, Yo Gabba Gabba, then you probably can kind of deduce what the Aquabats <laughs> are all about. <laughs> so there's that. There was a third one band member who was also really Mormon. Also, Cove Reber, who was, I think that might be how, his, how you say his name, but I'm not positive. He was the lead singer for Sayosin for a number of years, 
is still Mormon. I think he was born and raised in Utah. He still resides in Utah. So that's not something that I, I didn't listen to Seosin, but I, there probably are a handful of elder emos, I would call them, that listen to Seosin that maybe watch us. Also, not in the the alt vein, but and probably not an active Mormon anymore uh, from what I have read and people have said, but Dinah Jane Hansen of Fifth Harmony is also Mormon, and I know Fifth Harmony has since disbanded, but kind of interesting. The most interesting fact about all of this is of everybody that we have mentioned today, the one person that's part of a music group that I have seen in concert is Fifth Harmony <laughs> or Dinah Jane's, Jane Hansen, which is just really weird. So, I've seen one of the not active ones. Yeah, I I'm guess a I've, I've seen Panic fan. I've seen Brandon. I've Yuri. seen Brandon Yuri probably eight times, at least. Wow, he's hot as hell, dude. You can't you can't argue with that. Jordan is an emo at heart. I am. I had an emo phase that is really embarrassing. Anywho, I hope you enjoyed this somewhat chaotic video about Mormon musicians. And yes, just this one has been chaotic. <laughs> All of our videos are chaotic if you've been around long enough. But I hope this was interesting to you. If there is anybody particularly in this group that you would like to see more of a deep dive in, please drop it in the comments. Let us know. We've had a lot of interest in the Osmonds, so we probably will do a video on them. But if there are others that are speaking to you, definitely drop it in the comments. Let us know. If you made it this far, congratulations. We're at the end. <laughs> if this is something that you like to see more of, you can hit that subscribe button. And if you would like to win one of our signature scented candles from Exmo Candle Co., you can go over to the last video that we did and you can comment after you've subscribed and then you will be entered into winning one of those candles. You can also just buy them if you do not end up winning the giveaway. There is a link in There's the description. There's a link in the description. All of the Exmo Candle Co. candles are amazing. So they, they are high quality, awesome products. If you would like some more additional insanity that might not be as related to this YouTube channel or the podcast channel that you're listening to. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok. You can find us at Jordan and McKay. Jordan uploads shit to Instagram all the time. She's awesome. I like the stuff that she posts. I don't really participate in it because she is better at that than I am. So go and follow us over there. I even respond to DMs when I can, so. Yeah, she's a badass, honestly. So go go follow our Instagram. If you'd like to get in contact with us or our awesome community, you can hit up our Discord. The link is in the description. Super easy way to get in contact with us if you just got a quick question or anything of the sort. There's lots of good discussion that happens there. Also, final plug for the Patreon. I've, we've done it way too much this video, but if you would like to support us, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Jordan and McKay. And you can get access to a lot of cool exclusive content. That's all I'll say about that because we've talked it to death. Final thing is just a reminder, you can get awesome merch based on these sticker des designs or these stickers themselves in our Etsy shop, Happy Brain Collective or on our Teespring. Thank you everybody for watching. This is an amazing thing that you have allowed us to do and we will see you next time.